we talked about development, we talked about how big we sell, we know how we can drive the teams, we know the steps to drive the town, and now we're going to talk about the periphery. So when the T cell finally leaves the thymus, it's going to go into the secondary lymphatic tissue. If it never meets its special antigen, it won't uh, become activated, it will undergo apoptosis in about eight weeks' time, uh, give or take. About eight weeks. Um, and then what we will see is if it actually finds a special antigen, we have to activate it. So just because <coughs> it contains all the uh, components via polymature T cell, it hasn't been fully activated. Okay. So when it leaves the thymus, we usually refer to those T cells that left the thymus as 90 T cells. So some people say it's four. Some people will say it leaves the signature. They just say 19, so for 19. Once the virus is in it, it's going to go through a couple of activation steps, and then it will be a full to activate T cells. This is upon the first time this T cell sees the infection. There are three different steps for activation. The first is antigen presentation. The second is going to be a post stimulatory receptor. No, I don't have that up here. I'll, I'll show you a picture where I have it. And the third is going to be um, the third is going to be a cytokine signal. Uh, this is going to happen for both your T helper cells and your T so this is a picture of both your naive uh, T cells, both CD4 and CD8. Okay, so we're talking about the normal cell set. Um, and, and what happens, we're going to go into a lot of detail about each of these steps. Step one is the PCR and MHC interactions. Step two are the whole receptors. Right here. Uh, B7 is going to be on the antigen, oh, B7, sorry, okay, it's going to be on the antigen presenting cell, and CD28 is going to be on the T cell. There. And then the third and final is your cytokine release. So what happens is the T cell binds to the antigen presenting cell. We get a first signal, a second signal. Those two will cause the T cell to pop off the antigen presenting cell. The third signal will be the IL-2. IL-2 will then cause this T cell to proliferate. The proliferating T cell will then be of two different denominations. It will either be a memory T cell. Those are usually going to stay in the periphery tissue, in the secondary lymphatic tissue where it's found. And then you'll have the preptor T cells. And those are going to migrate to the site of infection and do whatever they need to do. So the cytotoxic T cells can interact with uh, the, the infected cells, and if it's a uh, effector T cell, the uh, CD4 T cell is going to release cytokines. It's going to release them in that area. Yes. So finding its antigen means that it's presented the antigen by the agency only. Like it's not just finding antigen. Right. It's yes. Yeah. Finding its antigen, it has to be presented through an antigen presenting cell. It has eight weeks to do that. Approximately. Yes. And IL2 is just that's just causing cerebral vision. Right, IL-2 is going to cause uh, proliferation and division. We're not going to see somatic hypermutation with our T-cell. Okay, that won't happen at all. We'll only see um, that TCR that was made is going to stay. We're not going to do anything bumpy to it. We're just going to adjust it. Yes. What is the IL-2 R? Receptor, IL-2 receptor. IL-2 R. IL-2 R, the R stands for receptor. It's a receptor R. Because... We'll go through each step, but if you notice, in this part of the picture, there's no IL-2 receptor. IL-2 receptor is not um, expressed unless there is an activation. So you don't put it up on the surface unless there's some activation sort of signal that means, okay, now I need to proliferate. So it's not always present. Whereas the TCR is always present on the surface. All right, so here are the receptors and co-receptors, the ones we're going to focus on. I'll point out here. So in, 
this is your uh, this is your sorry, over here. This is your CD4 T cell right here on this side, and this is your HG presenting cell. This is your MHC class two. Okay, this is the non-self peptide, right? Always non-self if it's MHC class two. This is your TCR right here. These two interact, and that is the first step. CD4 is also going to interact with the alpha chain of the MHC class two, and this is gonna help with internal signal. And remember we talked about our CD3 as our co-receptor, that's gonna cause the internal signal. So the TCR will interact with the MHC uh, molecule, self-peptide, gonna cause a signal through CD3. CD4 is also going to help. That's the first, it's the number one signal. Second thing that happens is uh, we will put up co-receptors. <coughs> so um, we'll stick up CD28 on the T cell on the surface. So prior to the interaction of MHC with TCR, we do not have CD28 on the cell surface. So this interaction causes CD28 to pop up. That will interact with B7. B7 is also known as CD80, CD86. Okay, so B7, CD80, CD86, they're all the same thing. Um, your book, your book flips. I tend to say B7, that's the way I marked it, uh, but it's equally acceptable to say CD80. Uh, CD80, CD86. Okay, that's the second thing. After this, the T cell will pop off. Now, in order for this interaction to occur at all, we have to have adhesion molecules. So we have our LFA1, our ICAM, remember our ICAM are based on adhesion molecules. We have LFA3 over here, and CD2, that's an adhesion molecule. Again, these are all strong adhesion molecules. And if you look here, this right here is the T cell. This right here is the antigen presenting cell. So it almost looks like the antigen presenting cell is going to engulf the T cell. It's just trying to get as much contact, as much surface area as it can because something really cool happens when we make the initial contact. There are two areas on the cell surface. So we're on the T cell surface here. Okay. And we have something called the P SMAC and the C SMAC. And the P SMAC stands for. I have it written down. Peripheral supermolecular activating complex. No one ever says it. They all say PSMAC. And what this means is that your T TCR kind of distributed throughout the membrane of the T cell. So they're kind of all over. And then we have something called the C SMAC, and this is central supermolecular activating complex. And when, so let me back up here a little bit. When T cell just hanging out, trying to figure out what's going on, our C SMAC will contain a ton of adhesion molecules. So it will contain our LFA1 and it will contain CD2 on the surface. And those will kind of be clustered or grouped a little more closely together. Where the TCR is going to be just kind of almost equally spread out throughout the membrane, right? They're not all going to be grouped together, just kind of interspersed throughout the membrane. Whereas our adhesion molecules are going to be a little more clustered. So when we're just floating around, checking things out, our C SMAC contains adhesion molecules and our P SMAC contains a TCR. They're being really distrib distributed throughout the membrane. Now the T cell comes in contact with its special antigen. And we see something really cool occur. We see that adhesion molecules start to kind of move to the side, up to the side and our TCR come together into the middle. So our adhesion molecules move into what we call the PSMAC, so the periphery, and our TCR moves into the middle. And this is because, unlike antibody-antigen binding, it's a strong, tight bind, our TCR-MHC is a kind of a weaker bind. So what we'll see happening is a TCR will bind to one MHC molecule, pop off, bind, pop off. Then another TCR will come in and bind to that same MHC molecule. Bind, pop off. Then another one. So we've moved our TCR so they can interact with 
the MHC. So we only need, this is really helpful, because we only need a little bit of antigen. We have a very small amount of antigen, and then it will elicit this big signal inside the T cell. Because one might not be strong enough. We might need more. We do need more. To elicit the reaction from the T cell that we have for T. Okay? So when this is occurring, our, when we get antigen, when we get TCR MHC interaction, we move the TCR to the CSMAP and the adhesion molecules to the CSMAP. So it will look like this. Right here, this is a picture, which I really, really love because it looks very, very pretty. Um, the PSMAC is containing all your adhesion molecules, right? And the CSMAP is now your TCR and CD3, right in the middle. Like a little donut hole inside the donut. Okay. Okay, and that's what happens. But if you were to look at this, when it, there's no binding, you would see that the TCR is kind of spread out and then that adhesion molecules is more close, closely clustered together. Okay. This is going to happen for a CD4 or a CD8 T cell. It doesn't matter which type of T cell you're talking about. They're both going to do the same thing. Questions on that? So what is the, what happened? CD28 on that, is that correct? That, that just is expressed on the membrane after TCR binds to, right. and then what is, what is CD28 then? So it's going to be the second signal. And what happens? It's a... Binding to our B7 or our CD8 and CD8 system. Okay, so it's kind of like a CD type of system. Right. The, the CD28, we don't usually refer to it moving into the CSMAP because it's going to pop up next to an MHC, which will already be in the CSMAP. So it's not present right. when this initial <coughs> is And wait, so then what's stimulating the uh, TCR move from CSMAP to CSMAP? There is an original binding of one TCR with one MHC. So it just binds somewhere randomly, and then it's moving and the whole receptor and everything into the cell. That's right. Then we see the receptors that were on the periphery move towards where that MHC is. Correct. Correct. Very good. Right. If we look over here, we didn't talk about our, our CD8 T cell, but if we look over here, we see that the TCR, we still have the uh, CD3, which is going to cause the antigen signaling. We have our CD8 interaction here. That's going to bind on the alpha 3 domain. Uh, we have the CD28, right? So as a matter of fact, we talked about uh, cytotoxic four and the helper. They're both going to use CD28. That's going to pop up. That's going to be the second signal. And they have similar adhesion molecules. They put the same adhesion molecules here. I don't care that you know the names of these adhesion molecules for this. We do need to know TCR MHC. We do need to know CD4 or CD8 comes in and binds, helps with the co-signal, uh, co co-stimulatory signal, and then that causes CD8. Sorry, CD28 pop up. CD28 plus CD80, 86, or 86, bind together, and that gives us the second signal. So those names you need to know. You need to know the order that they go in. The adhesion molecules, you need to know that we get movement in the membrane. Right? They'll start off in the C-snot and then move to the T-snot. But you do not need to know that LK1 binds to IK1. You can, but you don't, that's not. real activation that is occurring right now other than to put up uh, B7 or CD80 on its surface. So by putting up MHC class 1, it's already going to have um, CD80 on its surface. So the antigen presenting cell is like, it's not doing anything. It's just going to present and go, go activate. So it's not, the interaction of MHC and PCR does nothing to the cell. Mm -hmm. CD4, this is going to be a co-internal signal, an internal signal to the T cell. Same for CD8. So along with our C3 
CD3. This is going to be help with an internal cell cycle. Okay. Yes, don't, yeah, don't flip them. Don't flip them. Lots of people won't flip. Don't flip. Okay. Okay, so this says what I said before. Signal one. Signal 2, CD28, CD80. And this is going to be a number of different cytokines, one being IL-12, but the big one, the big one that's going to get the signal is IL-2. Okay, so IL-2 will have an autocrine activation. This is a T helper cell. We'll also have a paracrine that activates a couple more cytokines for us. That happens after CD80 binds? Yes, happens after. <laughs> um, there's other receptors besides CD28 that can activate it. ICOS is one of them. Um, sometimes ICOS is, is presented on uh, T cells. Sometimes the interaction of T cells and B cells requires an ICOS. We're not gonna we're not gonna worry about ICOS. We know that there's another standard receptor. This can all be shut down. Right? Once we want the, uh, the activation to stop, we're going to produce IL10. I just talked about it kind of fun. And in addition, that will cause a receptor to pop up on the surface. PTLA4 is my personal favorite, but there's others. There's uh, PD1, there's PTLA. What these all do is they will block the binding of the co-receptor, right? So instead of having CD28 and CD80 bind together, what we'll see is CTLA4 will bind with CD80, and that causes a stop signal, right? The stop signal in this case is stronger than the start signal. So once those two bind, that will shut down. Even if MHC and TCR are still present, that will shut down the signaling process. Along with uh, IL-10. Yeah. Uh, the is the, 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 the uh, who's producing IL-10? Who's producing IL-2? The T-cell. If it's a T-helper, the T-cell. If it's a T-side toxic, it's probably a little bit of itself and more so for the t <coughs> yes. Yes. I'm out of connect. Yes, it's on a cell system. What is CTLA4? These are receptors that are on the ABCs. No, these are receptors that are on the T. What activates them? IL10. Then what causes them to be expressed? Are they always expressed? They're not always expressed. So when IL10 binds to a T cell, that will cause it to express CTLA4, which will bind to uh, CD80, and that will cause a stop. Okay, so bind to CD80 on the ABC. In That's the right. Of IL10. That's right. Okay. Um, we don't need to know the specifics. Positive, even if you know that they're positive and negative. Negative, just like that. Again, E7 here, you're, again, the book does a really bad job of keeping it consistent. E7 is the same thing as CD80. E7 is the same, E71 is CD80, and E72 is CD86. They're the same thing, so don't, don't get overwhelmed by that. It's the same exact thing. Uh, our negative ones have a higher affinity. They are going to outcompete CD20, so they will bind to the post stimulatory receptor, and again, that gives a negative. Uh, uh, PD, PD1 does a very similar thing. Uh, very similar. Uh, and in addition, it can cause some affected cells to undergo apoptosis. This is an interesting thing that can occur is if you get a T cell. And it binds to an antigen-presenting cell, the MHC1 and 2, and it gets that first signal. 
but for some reason there is no post similar for signal. There's no C twenty eight D seven binding for whatever reason. That will cause that T cell to become interneutral. Okay, meaning it's not going to undergo apoptosis. It's just going to kind of be there. So when it's presented to the MHC a second time, and it's able to bind to our B seven, it won't respond. Okay. Um, you, it won't respond. This is really kind of useful, not in our own bodies for everyday activity. This information is more useful with treatment options, especially with transplantations and autoimmune disorders. So what we're trying to figure out, what people are doing now, is they're taking T cells and they're trying to block the co-stimulatory signal, the secondary signal to make the T cell energistic. That way, if they are seeing inappropriate MHC, it will shut down the response. The T cell will die, but it will shut down any response. The problem with that is you still are shutting down the whole T cell response. We haven't gotten specific enough that we're quite there to get this, this is a, okay, you told me how to put slide. We're not specific enough to bind to just the T cells that are being activated. It's going to bind to any activated T cell at the time. So it's going to wipe out part of the immune system. Although it doesn't appear to be as much of a drop as if you're taking corticosteroids or uh, immunosuppressants. So it's going to only wipe out at, trying to activate T cells. And so that's what a lot of therapy are kind of trying to What's really going to stimulate the T cell? Uh, it's going to be your antigen presenting cells, uh, specifically your dendritic cells. Those can activate naive effector and memory T cells. So they can activate the whole game. Uh, again, we talked about the crossover pathway with dendritic cells. Your dendritic cell can present to both MHC1 and 2. So if it takes in a pathogen, the uh, bacteria is only going to present MHC plus 2. So you don't need a cytotoxic T cell response because those T cells only target virally infected cells, right? Or cancerous cells. Everyone cell things inside. Um, however, if you have a virally infected cell, which the antigen presenting cell will present to our cytotoxic T cell, we also need the T helper cell, especially for that IL2 release. So again, as I mentioned, the cytotoxic will use a little bit of IL2, it's not really enough. We need that T helper in order to get the where will we find uh, these? All over. So our dendritic cells will find all over. Um, our macrophages, these are really going to activate our effector and memory T cells. Okay, so they're going to be ones, usually, again, because our macrophages aren't migrating to the secondary lymphatic tissue, they're going to only activate our effector and memory. So they're only going to activate the ones that they kind of come in contact with. These memory cells might be a these memory cells might be a different subset entirely. We might call them effector memory cells. We're not sure if they last as long. But right now we classify them in the memory category. B cells, same situation, they're only going to do your effector or memory. They are not capable of activating our naive T cells. And really that's the dendritic cells. Questions on that? There are situations where pathogens bypass the system. This is something we call usually a super antigen. And super antigens, what super antigens do is they are capable of taking the TCR and MHC and holding them in a locked position. So remember when we talked about the P smack and the C smack a moment ago, and I said there's popping on and popping off, right? Well, in this case, the TCR and the MHC are locked together. The antigen is locking them or binding them up together. So the T cell constantly thinks that there's an infection, 
right? So we see this. This is pretty, uh, pretty well understood. Again, it short circuits the the T cell, um, and it, it tells the C cell that there is a huge problem. We see this oftentimes with food poisoning. So your Staphylococcus will cause a super make a super antigen that causes this type binding. Toxic shock syndrome. We see that as the toxic shock. That's the other common one. Uh, used to be Streptococcus was a big one, rheumatic fever. Um, we get shocked with it. Um, certain types of arthritis we think start and are caused by uh, a super antigen. Any questions on that? Yes. MHC? Yeah. Yes. Uh, whether or not, I mean, I'm not, not sure if it's, okay, so are you asking if it puts it up on the surface and T cell will never recognize that? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's a different question that I thought was worth asking. Because viruses can block the MHC presentation a number of different ways. They do that all the time. But if it's put up on the surface, is there a possibility that a T cell won't recognize it? Sure. Sure. How probable I think we will never. How often I also don't know. But that's possible. That you'll make it, the, the pathogen will make uh, an antigen, a self presented antigen. So that will make a self presenting antigen that our, none of our T cells will make. That's probably more based on genetics a little bit, um, as opposed to something something else. I'm not sure it's possible. Yeah. I have a question on the question. Yeah. Is that called osteoporosis? No, it'd be more like lymphoma. We'll get inflammation. Would a rheumatoid be like kind of long term? It, it could progress to long term. So, I could buy a lot of really weird pathogens. Yeah. You could have a salt wall in the back. You could have a skin through that right back and put it inside your cell as an extracellular pathogen. Yeah, they make really big, these big macro, macro molecules. So, they make multiplicated macrophages. And those can end up taking deposit in your joints. You might be able to clear it, but then it continues on. Your, your body all of a sudden starts to make an antigen. Uh, you get, um, it, it falls under the category of an autoimmune disorder at that point. So you have certain pathogens that can trigger an autoimmune disorder. So they start with the pathogen Yes, similar. Yes. So I'm trying to understand really what happens when this super antigen mm -hmm. And what happens when the TCR and MHC, they are stuck? So what's like a common thing that happens in all of these? Internal cell signaling. So remember when we did the, so he's at, trying to ask like, what happens when these two are locked together. Remember when we went over the toll-like receptors? We went over through that pathway, and then the result was cytokine release, and activation, and all those other things? There's a different pathway that occurs, but the concept is still the same. The pathway continually goes, so you continually get activation, so you continually can Continually release inflammatory <coughs> cytokines, so you continually have this big immune response. When the pathogen may be gone, it's just this antigen that's holding them. But the pathogen may not need quite so a much of a robust response. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so um, I know it's really a bad thing for someone who's trying to present well, What about the pathogen itself? Because yeah. then the response is going to be really. Right. What well, pathogens are being like taken care of? So the, the pathogen usually becomes dead at some point, but the, the toxin or the toxin or the super antigen portion is still circulating. We don't, we haven't removed it. So while we've taken care of the pathogen itself, the effect of that pathogen is still present. So we still think the pathogen is present, even though it may be, we may have taken care of it. 
But so the question some is, of them we won't, but some of them we will. Yeah, so why would you, why would you use that? Um, it doesn't seem like a good system. Yeah. An anthrax does that. Anthrax has a couple of different toxoids. One of them is a sub super antigen, which causes this overwhelming, it's bacillus separase, it's anthrax, it's the same thing, overwhelming immune response. It's not the pathogen itself that kills people. It's the immune response to that pathogen that ends up causing people to, to unfortunately die. Anthrax is pretty, pretty nasty in that, um, I think it's got a 90% uh, death rate, even with treatment, it's a really, really high mortality once once it's in. Yeah, the inhaled form. There's cutaneous. There's other. There's other forms. The inhaled is pretty rare. It's a very specific consistency. Yeah, right. the reason why I ask is because mostly when this pathogen uses this kind of pathways, but then to last long, mm -hmm. the system, mm -hmm. well, if you utilize the right. And, right. And, right. So Ebola is another. They don't, Ebola doesn't use a super antigen, it does other nasty things. But Ebola, why you see it not, not spreading all over and staying kind of localized is because it kills too fast and it uses such aggressive me methods that it doesn't have time to transfer to the next person. Yes? So not the super antigen beneficial to the pathogen. I don't know. I don't know because in my mind, a pathogen needs to replicate and then move. Replicate and move, replicate and move before it, before it gets caught. If the super antigen doesn't allow the pathogen to get caught, it's fine. But the super antigen is causing the immune system to be triggered. I don't know how it's helpful. I, I don't know. I'm not, I don't know. Yes? It's only going to be the T helper. Because if the T site toxic is locked in, it's only going to keep focusing on that one cell, but that one cell is going to undergo apoptosis. So it won't matter. It's only the T helper. Yes? So, so why would the T helper cell constantly secrete uh, cytokines if it was only binding the, uh, the T helper? Uh, yeah, MHC complex. Oh, yeah. So there, there is. The there'll be a co stimulatory. It's just showing you. Oh, the co stimulatory will happen. Yeah. Good question. They just didn't show it. I thought I saw another hand in the back. Yeah. Yes. Wait, so if it's binding, it's binding the TCR and the MHC2, wouldn't it also have to bind the O receptors? That's what he just asked. Yeah, yeah, it just wasn't in that picture. They're there. They're there. Other questions? Anyone know the difference between food poisoning and food illness? Well, so food poisoning is just the toxins produced by the organs and food infection is actually the bacteria itself right. growing in the tumors. Okay. Okay. So. so food poisoning, again, the toxins are there. The bacteria may be gone. You, really, the bacteria is not the issue. It's the toxin. It's the super antigen that's there. The effects are going to be the same. You're going to vomit, diarrhea, you could produce fever, all those fun, fun things. It's going to happen within the first eight hours of eating food. Food illness is you eat bacteria, but that's usually undercooked food. And that's going to happen eight hours to about 24 hours after you ate the food. So it's really kind of smart because it's based on time and it's based on what you're eating. Food poisoning is fast, food illness is slow. Yes? Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure. You can get food poisoning from, you know, someone putting, um, sure, venom would do it, uh, or uh, what else? Uh, like a laxative that would be considered food poisoning. Um, it's something that you should have in your food. Unbeknownst to you, if it's beknownst to you and, and you need it for a medical reason, go ahead and take it. That's not food poisoning, but unbeknownst to you, that's food poisoning. Okay. So um, if they food, but virals, is it the one that leaves something like this for C or B? Food viruses? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. They, you can get enough C for eating. Yeah, 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 yeah. That doesn't fall in the food poisoning category. 
that would fall more in a proof of illness category, and we usually don't consider it. Uh, uh, yeah, but I don't think I can. I don't think it's classified under the food illness. No. It's a foodborne illness, but it doesn't. It doesn't elicit the same diarrhea, vomiting, sweats, fevers, chills. That that kind of These these are these are diseases that cause a fairly immediate response. Right. I know twenty four hours doesn't feel like immediate, but that's in the grand scheme of things, that's immediate. Your Hep C's, your 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 long term viruses, those those are. Um, the food board illnesses, but they're not going to be food poisoning or food illness in this type of sort of thing. Yes, yes, now we have really good treatments for it, which is amazing. Poor people just die. No, they're going to live in the, the Hep C, well, Hep C, A, B, all go to the liver. Food poisoning usually will, will flush out, will flush out. The thing you have to worry about with food poisoning is uh, uh, septic shock, right? So, um, and cytokine storms and dehydration. That's a real big one. You, usually, the other two sometimes, uh, but dehydration is a big one. So, fluids, keeping fluids down, fluids down. Um, that kind of stuff. And the easiest way to keep fluids down are popsicles. Because you don't want to just do straight water. Straight water is kind of sugar. That's what pops up. Usually, you're not, you don't, it, so you can absorb it. Oh, really? That is awesome. Gatorade, too, but usually, so this is completely off a tangent. If you are dehydrated or feel like feverish or something, when you drink water or Gatorade or whatever you're drinking, you usually take fairly big gulps or bigger gulps. What ends up happening is that ends up not being absorbed by the body because you usually end up puking too fast. If you do something in little sips, like two tablespoons, but people don't usually do that because it feels too long when you're thirsty. Sucking on a, um, a popsicle or something frozen with, with sugar in it helps you absorb the water better and you, you take it over a slower course of time. Right? So then you don't vomit. You're less likely to vomit it back up and it will absorb it. Uh, just, just for all you sugar treaters out there, I know sometimes people it's not candy, it's something a little more exciting. And so if you feel you got too excited, popsicles. You can make Gatorade popsicles, stick a stick in it, or a Gatorade ice cubes. That is also very helpful with Pedialyte. I know that's for children, but it has a lot of sugar and some salt con content to it, and that helps uh, with your overall hydration. So just, just a little advice for you going out there. Okay. <laughs> So this is um, for adults. This is the cycle of the cell. What's advised to it? And again, we're going to produce eventually memory and effector cells. Okay. All right. We have a number of different subsets of T cells. We talked about um, our T helpers and our T cytotoxic. Within our T helpers, there are at least five distinct, and that is probably incorrect at this point. I think we just added another subset. But we're going to go over five. T helper one and T helper two. T helper one cells are the ones we talk about most of the time when we talk about infection. So when we're talking about a virus or a bacteria, we're usually discussing the activity and the cytokine release from our T helper one. Our T helper twos we usually see when we have big pathogens, meaning our parasites, right? Our worms, our fungus, our protozoa. So we usually switch over to a T helper two response for those situations. In the United States, we don't usually see too many parasitic infections or fungal infections. Although some we talk about when we talk about fresh, uh, fairly common ones, so we do have a T helper two response. We usually see an increase in T helper twos when we talk about allergies. So we will get allergies to respond to the T helper two response. T helper 17, I've mentioned a couple of times, this is a really strong pro-inflammatory T cell. It releases a lot of IL-17. It's a very, very strong response. Our T regulatory cells, I mentioned those a few minutes ago, these are really going to stop the immune response. So when the time comes with the immune response, we need to quiet down with we'll our T regulatory cells. 
these T cells will secrete a lot of IL-10 and will be activated by IL-10. So IL-10 released by surrounding cells will activate a T regulatory cell. Certain viruses use this to their advantage. They'll release IL-10, they'll activate a T regulatory response, so it quiet, helps quiet down. So not only is a cell that's infected have a IL-10, a disease IL-10, but the T regulatory cells will say, hey, I've checked it out, it's quiet, we need to be quiet over here. And then we have the T follicular helper cells. You can find those T cells in the B cell germinal center. They're going to help with B cell activation after somatic hypermutation. <coughs> These guys usually don't migrate, they're really just there for um, B cell activation. We don't know where most of these subsets arise from. So we don't know if these all arise from the thymus or if we're going to make these subsets when we, when we move out into the periphery. Okay. We do know that a T helper one can become a T helper two and a T helper two can become a T helper one. We have seen that switching back and forth. We don't know if they can switch with other ones. Each one's going to reduce the same cytokine, but they're going to have a specific activity. I thought I saw it. Yes? Uh, can you tell me more about what the case Normal infection, uh, bacteria and virus. So the infection is the Okay. In order to make sure that you have a T helper one stimulation, the T helper will bind, will go through first signal, second signal, there'll be an IL-2 receptor, we'll get the IL-2 receptor signal. So the other thing that the T helpers need is to know if it needs to be a one or a two. If this in, uh, in the presenting cell starts producing IL-12, so this is IL-12 right here, squeeze it, this will then become a T helper one. If this antigen presenting cell, however, produces IL-4, this will then trigger this T cell to become an IL, I'm sorry, not IL, a T helper two T cell. So T helper one is triggered by IL-12. T helper two responds to IL-4. It's, they both start off as the same T helper. It just depends on the cytokine that's present at the time, designate which type of T cell this is going to be, helper one or helper two. Yes, it can do, we're going to have IL-2, it's not showing you IL-2, IL-2 will be a cell stimulation. Um, this is already signaled, this has already been signaled, so our first signal or second signal, IL-2 will be down here in the autocrine. Yeah, so once the dendritic cell binds to the pathogen and it presents it and it interacts with the T cell, once because the dendritic cell knows what it's interacting with, right? The dendritic cell remember bound to that pathogen through like a toll like receptor. It knows, yes, yeah, a virus or a worm or a bacteria. So it knows those what it was dealing with. Right. So the yes, the antigen presenting cell is telling the T cell, I have a virus, I have a bacteria, or I have a worm. And so depending on that, it's going to release its cytokine. So if it has a bacteria or a virus, it's going to release IL-12. That will make the T cell T helper one. And if it's a, a um, a fungus um, or a big path or a worm, a big pathogen that's present is going to release IL-4. Yes. Oh, is there any structural difference between the TH1 and T? Physically, no. no. The difference is what cytokines they're going to release yeah, afterwards. Exactly. So structurally, physically, they're the same. Um, under light microscopy, I can't distinguish the difference. <clears throat> there will be, <coughs> pardon me, there are some specific uh, cytokine receptors that will pop up, so under flow cytometry you can you can distinguish, because you can tag those uh, receptors with an antibody and, and have those light up. 
but under normal um, <laughs> normal like microscopy, you can't tell. So generally, if all the T cells that have yeah. those receptors, it's just when they become T1 or T2, that's when they become active. That's right. That's right. Yes. So how does a T cell decide to be um, becoming a helper that also, it also has further receptors to help the one that's right. Does it do that with other ones? Like, do you help? Is that a gene? Yes, we think so. There isn't as much data on it, and we, we think so. We don't know at this point if this T cell can be a T helper 1, 2, or even a T helper 17. We know a T helper 1 and 2 can switch. We don't know if a T helper 17 can come into play with it. We're not sure. So for the other T helpers or fellows or help T cells, right. that has to be decided from one point and it's always. We're not sure. We don't we don't know. We don't know. But T helpers we do know can do a little bit of flipping of the T regulatory. Um, but again, I can't give you whether or not they come out of thymus as mm -hmm. like that. We did. Remember, we talked about the instructive model, so the stochastic model. Oh, right. Yeah, so we, we don't know, but those are our guesses. Is there a difference that we know in activation between those two cells when they bind to the ABC? Like, I mean, other than the you know structural difference between ABC1 and 2. But so, but like, so the Cytotoxic T cells, they don't, do they not have receptors for IL-4, IL-12, like that type of thing? Uh, they won't have a receptor really for IL-4. Um, IL-12, yes. IL-12 definitely does. They're capable of making them, but they, I don't, I'm unaware of them making IL-4 receptor differences. Yes? So you said the T cell wanted to make a switch back and forth? Yes. But um, if the T cell one say already binds to a, a APC cell and then it triggers to be a T cell one, whenever it recognizes that pathogen, it always be a T cell one. No, not necessarily. Generally speaking, yes, because that would elicit an IL twelve release from the antigen presenting cell. So more than likely, yes. But if the antigen presenting cell for some reason produced IL four, it could switch back to a T helper. Two. Well, if it's the same pathogen, then because if it's the same pathogen, because of the TC. if it's the same oh, pathogen, we will more than likely from the antigen presenting cell produce the same cytokine that would tell that T cell what it needs to be. But that T cell is not locked into being a T helper one or T helper two. So if the antigen presenting cell say had some sort of strange mutation, we could force it to flip. We could force it to flip. So there's certain uh, uh, viruses that do just this. They'll switch the response from a T helper one to a T helper two. HIV does that. It forces a T helper two response because of the release of cytokines when it should be a T helper one response. If we can switch it back to a T helper one response, we might be more effective in combating HIV using our immune system. These are uh, a number of different cytokines and uh, what genes they regulate, what the effective cytokine is, <coughs> and the function, the function that we see. We don't need to really that, but in case you're interested in data. All right, as I was saying, the naive T cell we think can split off, and again, we're not 100% sure if it's going to pick the lineage in the thymus or in the periphery. I just explained one instance where we know it puts it in the periphery, but I can't be for sure for the other one. Uh, this is our T regulatory. It's going to be induced by TGF beta, IL-10 also, meaning if there is a lot of anti-inflammatory cytokines, we'll get our T regulatory. This, our T helper 17, IL-1, 6, IL-23, these are all very strong pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, and sometimes when you stimulate with TGF beta, those four conjunctions, so even though TGF beta is only a stop cytokine, in this case it can cause activation, which is pro inflammatory. 
Uh, IL-4 is going to do our gate helper uh, too, and again, we'll get a lot more IL-4, 5, IL-13. Again, this is supposed to be our worm response, but we do see it more with allergies. Uh, T follicular, so we'll have a lot of IL-6 and 12. Again, this is two things that we have more pleasant. And T helper 1, uh, IL-12 being our big one, but IL-8, um, interference in gamma, and IL-18. Again, this is going to trigger the normal immune response as we have learned about it in class. Yes? The time is not really that's right. This is going to happen. All this happens after activation. So after we get MHC PCR, after CD28 B7, after IL2 stimulation, this is when we're going to get this kind of activation. Or during IL2 stimulation, kind of at the same time. That's when we're going to get this stuff. Before we do it, we're trying to get the same No, there has to be some sort of horrible infection in the thyroid. This is all appropriate. This is going to be in the lymph nodes. It's all in the We don't know if it picks outside. We don't know if it picks in the thymus, that's going to be a T helper 17, or if that's caused by being in the peripheral. We know we will get activation of these, especially our T helper 17, with these cytokines. We are assuming. Right, the nerve cells will not present themselves inside the thymus, but we don't know that T cell has chosen that lineage. So there's a possibility that the T cell chooses its lineage, chooses to be a T helper 1 or T helper 2, and that choice might be made inside the thymus. So right now we know that T helper 1 and T helper 2 can go back and forth. A T cell in the thymus might make the choice that I'm going to be a T helper 1 or T helper 2 subset. I will not switch over to a T helper 17. No, we don't think that, we're not sure if they need to be activated to make that choice. Yes? So those that have this icon Type of T cell based, based on uh, release of a homolog cytokine? Yes. 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 So there are um, some therapies right now where we try to force a T regulatory response as opposed to an effector, or, or as opposed to a um, T helper 1 or T helper 2 response. So we do sometimes use cytokine homolog, although not uh, super or always effective. from the cytokine, it will either turn on GATA3 or turn on TBET. TBET will stop GATA3, GATA3 will stop the expression of TBET, and that's how we'll switch from T helper 1 to T helper 2. Helper 17, the T regulatories can switch back and forth. Not 100% sure. Not 100% sure. We know that IL 6 will cause T helper 17. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, it usually causes it to stop. This is a very weird situation. This is not a normal, it's normal because it's in us. But TGF beta is usually a stop cytokine. If TGF beta and IL 6 are present together, it will stimulate a T helper 17 response. If TGF beta is present by itself without the presence of IL 6, it will cause that T cell to be a T granular cell. We think. We think, yes. We think this is not fully, fully put out. So that is the, the prevailing theory right now. We think this is occurring. Okay, T follicular, as I said that. Um, there are possibly of other subsets. We think there's a T over nine. We also think there's a T over five. Okay. I know very little about those subsets. Everyone knows very little. Well, so those subsets. The the things we know about those subsets is there's a possibility of those subsets, and the subsets tend to produce the, a lot of the cytokine that they're the, the helper of. So T over one, T over two. Don't worry, they don't. They produce different cytokines. Your T over seventeen produces T seventeen. Your T over nine produces IL nine. Your T over five produces IL five. And that's about our understanding of those. Again, this is just what I said. We still don't know a lot. Um, we're pretty sure that T over ones and twos, uh, we're pretty sure they can't be a T over 17 or a T regulatory cell. That doesn't mean that that is for sure. There's still the many things to talk about. We just haven't seen it yet. Right now, that's, that's what we think. Uh, Again, there's a lot of fluidity, so it makes it very difficult to figure out what is going on. Okay. Um, so, pathogens will use this to their advantage. Uh, leprosy, um, which is uh, a mycobacterium tuberculosis, or mycobacterium, can stimulate, if it stimulates a T helper one response, the body will actually take care of it and will remove it from your body. But, it likes to actually stimulate a T helper two response. The majority of the population would remain a T helper two as opposed to a T helper one. And then you see leprosy uh, taking hold. Um, you can treat leprosy pretty pretty effectively with antibiotics. It's best to do. Um, it, it, it responds pretty, pretty well. So if you get treatment with antibiotics, you don't see um, the issues with it. Uh, but, but that's what's going on there. HIV, as I mentioned. Um, when it shifts, it sh wants to shift the response to a T helper 2 response. And so as the disease progresses, it slowly shifts our response, our immune response from T helper 1 to T helper 2. We usually see a full T helper 2 response when it's progressed to AIDS. Uh, and then our friend Epstein Barr, right there, uh, will produce a IL-10 homolog, which will stop the T helper 1 response, um, so you don't get any effective response there. Yeah, it should only respond to one. So HIV, right, so when it switches, when HIV switches into T helper 2, it renders the response ineffective. At that point, you have low levels of T cells. The ones you have are T alpha 2s, and they're not helpful at all. They're not going to respond correctly to the virus. Yes? Um, does the T alpha 1 mean that T alpha 2 are good for different situations? That's right. They're good for different situations, right? You don't want a T alpha 1 response for a big pathogen. It's, it's not effective. We have to stimulate mast cells, and we have to stimulate eosinophils, basophils, and. Come on, this one. Now those two, eosinophils, basophils, and mast cells. And the way we do that is to produce an antibody called IgE. T helper ones don't cause the B cells to produce IgE. T helper twos, they do. So when we get, um, however, when we switch to a bacteria or a virus, if the pathogen has switched us to a T helper two response, we're getting an antibody called, as I just mentioned, IgE, which is effective on mast cells, 
but we'll never see the pathogen. We'll never bind to the virus because it's not going to be in those areas of the body. And so we will not respond to it. We're going to skip this so we don't get worried about the surface markers. All right. And this is what I said a little bit ago. Um, when once the T cell is activated, we can have three things happen. We can have we can make an effector T cell. Well, actually, we can have two things happen. We can have an effector T cell, right? So that's going to be one that's producing the cytokines, or it's going to actively target virally infected cells, or we can have a memory cell. Okay, we talked about the different subsets of effector cells for our T helpers. There are possibly two different subsets of memory cells. One is going to be your central memory. These are going to reside in your secondary lymphatic tissue, so they'll either stay in the spleen, bulk, 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 or the lymph nodes. Okay, so they'll stay in those areas, and we'll see replication. They'll be uh, suppressed when not uh, there's when there's not an active infection. Although we will kind of uh, on occasion we will cause those uh, cellular uh, cent I'm sorry central memory cells to proliferate and activate these cells so we can produce a constant level of antibody in our, in our bloodstream. And then we have uh, effector memory cells, and these are going to go from the secondary lymphatic tissue to the site of infection, and they're going to help produce more effector T cells. So as long as the infection is going on, these memory cells will really be called on to proliferate more, make more memory cells at that location, and more effector cells at that location, so we don't have to keep traveling back and forth between the infection and our secondary lymphatic tissue. These tend to be short-lived. Um, they will switch back once IL-10 or TGF beta is released, they'll switch back to an effector state, and they will undergo apoptosis along with the other effector T cells once the T regulatory cells come in and help to stop. So again, these are proliferating cells. They won't be secreting cytokines. They won't be actively engaging with the cells that are violently infected or cancerous. And then they will switch back. They're just going to be there to proliferate. Right now, that's what we think. But again, this may not be true. It could be a lie. No, it's not really a lie. This is true as of this moment in time. Do the TEM cells come from TCM cells? Yes, they usually come from a TCM. Again, on foreign studies, uh, they may be asymmetrical position. We're not sure. Um, some are doing memory. Again, what signals are, are used to commit a cell from either effector or memory? We have no idea. Not sure. Uh, do memory cells reflect uh, heterogeneity of effector cells from primary response? No idea. We don't know. Um, are there differences between memory CD4 and memory CD8? Possibly. Not sure. These are all very good questions. Uh, we do know we have more CD8 than CD4, but we're not sure why. Uh, how are memory cells maintained over the years? Not sure. Don't know. No idea. The theory is that there might be a persistent cytokine or a persistent antigen presented. You might hold some dendritic cells in a memory state. And so they are able to present. So that's that's like a really far off theory. It's not far off theory, but that's a theory that we're not we're not even sure enough to say we're not sure about it. Does that make sense? No? Uh, but we're not just, we don't feel so confident that we're going to put in a textbook. Right? So we are really, we really just don't know. Um, we do know that cytokines, we do know we see cell division, and that's the result of IL-7 and usually IL-15. We don't know why we're producing those at any given time. The memory cells. And that is it for T-cells. Any questions?
I know I forgot to bring back the note cards from last class. I read your questions. I have the answers. I'll bring them back next class. Um, note card for today, though, is I would like a Halloween joke. That would be helpful for me. Um, so 